from the Controller Communicable Disease Manual. This is a presentation on measles. Measles also goes by the name of rubiella, hard measles, red measles, and morbili. We are vaccinated for the measles virus with that MMR vaccine. It stands for measles, mumps, and rubella. Don't confuse rubella with rubiola, another name for measles. Okay, measles is also rubiella. Rubella is another name for German measles, and that is a different virus entirely. Okay, so measles, rubiella, not rubella. Rubiella, measles. Rubiella, measles. So identifying a potential measles patient. Well, measles has a couple phases. One of those is the prodromal phase. And when we say prodromal, we mean the onset of symptoms, not necessarily the symptoms that identify the disease, but the symptoms that tell us the disease is about to come, that we're about to have those uh, common symptoms we associate with a particular disease. So we get a prodromal fever. We get what's called the three C's, which is cough, conjunctivitis, pink eye, and coryzoa. And coryzoa is another way of saying rhinitis, and all rhinitis is is inflammation of the nasal mucosa. So our three C's, cough, conjunctivitis, coryzoa, and then we also in the prodromal phase, we get something called coplic spots. And what coplic spots are, are these white or bluish spots. They have an erythematous base, but these spots that show up in the buccal mucosa, and the mucosa inside our mouth, you know, on the inside layer of our cheeks. So they're kind of white to bluish in color in the center, and they have an erythematous base, a red base. And you really only see these in measles. Um, so fever, cough, conjunctivitis, crozoa, and then coplic spots, that's what makes up the symptoms of your prodromal phase. And then you move into the traditional rash, right? That red blotchy rash that everybody associates with uh, measles. And this rash starts at the face and makes its way down to the body. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a cephalocaudal rash. Cephalo having to do with the head, caudal with the body, begins at the face, makes its way through the body. Measles is... Uh, like I said, is a virus, so it is taxing on the immune system. We're also going to see leukopenia in these patients, meaning they'll have a low uh, white blood cell count. And uh, it's more severe in our infants and our adults than it is in our children. But infants, they're particularly at risk for when they get this disease. So again, just go over the symptoms real quick uh, with a typical measles case. That is the prodromal fever, the cough, conjunctivitis, the corazoa making up our three C's, right? Pink eye, rhinitis, or inflamed nasal mucosa, the coplic spots, those white or bluish spots with erythematous bases on the buccal mucosa, the mouth, and then that red blotchy rash. So measles primarily infects the lungs. That's its route of entry. From our lungs, it's gonna multiply and move into our lymphatic system, into our lymph nodes. From there, it's gonna make its way into our blood. And from our blood, it's gonna to go to our intestines and it, to our brain. And this will help us understand why we get certain complications associated with measles. So complications associated with measles. Well, because your immune system's having to work, we're more prone to getting a bacterial super infection. And bacterial super infections can occur in the lungs, we can get it in the intestines, and we can see it in the brain. Um, another one I didn't put on here is we're prone to getting otitis media, uh, middle ear infection as well when we have measles. So measles in the lungs, well, if we get a bacterial secondary infection because of it, we're going to get a really bad pneumonia. In the intestines, we're going to get really severe diarrhea. And then in the brain, we're going to get encephalitis, right? Inflammation of the brain. Itis, right? Inflammation. And then encephala having to do with the brain. So encephalitis, when, it, when we get a a secondary infection of the brain. And why are we worried about these things? Because this can all lead to death. These are these can lead to the fatal cases of measles. Uh, in the 1990s, the death rate was about two to three people per 100, or sorry, excuse me, per 1,000 cases. And that mainly occurred in children under five. In developing countries, they can have a case fatality, fatality rate of three to 5%. And sometimes it can be as high as 10 to 30%, especially if they don't have any kind of medical research resources to provide that, you know, that supportive therapy. And your main cause of death with measles is complications from pneumonia or complications from the encephalitis, from the inflammation around the brain. Just uh, looking at the World, the World Health Organization, the WHO, their 2015 numbers, there was 
195,762 reported cases of measles, and there was 134,200 estimated deaths due to measles. So it's still out there, and it's still a significant cause of death. Immunizations has really driven down the, the mortality rate of this, but it's still out there, especially in the developing world. Other complications we have to worry about, especially in the developing world, is complications that stem from malnourishment. Right, somebody who's malnourished, they're at risk of having what's called uh, quashiorquor. It's a disease that has to do with protein deficiencies, and somebody with measles is going to have a complication of their quashiorquor. Um, another complication comes with people who have vitamin A deficiency. Vitamin A is essential to our ability to see. It's an essential component of our vision. So somebody who already has a vitamin A deficiency who gets measles, this can lead to blindness. And this is a leading cause of blindness in the developing world. Uh, usually people get blindness due to having a vitamin A deficiency and then getting measles on on top of that. One more complication we're going to talk about is subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. And what this is is a chronic form of a progressive brain inflammation caused by persistent infection of the measles virus. So what's happened, and it usually occurs when your infants are infected with measles, it looks like their immune system is one. It looks like they've gotten over that case of measles, but it kind of lies dormant and it may mutate, but it lies dormant for a couple of years. And this can come up a couple of years after that primary infection, and it's going to cause this inflammation of the brain, right? Encephalitis. Itis, inflammation, encephala, having to do with the brain, pan, the entire brain, panencephalitis. And this is a fatal condition. But like I said, this is more common when measles is contracted during infancy. They kind of get over the initial illness, but it lies dormant. It's reactivated and it causes severe inflammation of the brain that progressively gets worse and worse and worse. Um, and, it, and like I said, it's very fatal. Subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. So the infectious agent, well, it's a species measles virus. So that's kind of easy when it comes to the species. It comes from the family Paramyxa verde, and it comes from the genus Morbilla virus. Okay, so family Paramyxa verde, and the, fam the genus, excuse me, Morbilla virus. And then the species is just a measles virus. So motor transmission with measles. Well, measles is one of the most highly communicable diseases. It's easily spread. It's said that People who are not immunized, if they come in, 90% of them who come in contact with somebody who is infected with measles will get measles, will contract it. It's very, very communicable. Uh, it is spread by airborne, right? Meaning when people cough and sneeze, the, the uh, droplets they put out in the air are very contagious, but it's also spread by contact. So the surfaces that they cough or sneeze on will be contaminated and a potential route for contamination. If somebody touches that surface and then goes and wipes their mouth, their eyes, their nose, they are at risk for getting measles. So we're going to talk about the uh, phases of measles. Measles has a 10-day incubation period, meaning after somebody contracts the virus, they usually don't have symptoms until about 10 days. That's the average. Uh, from that incubation period, you're going to move into the prodromal phase. Remember the initial symptoms. And the prodromal phase is characterized by that prodromal fever. And that lasts about four days. Um, then after that, we got the three C's, right? Our cough, chorizoa, and conjunctivitis. That uh, rhinitis, chorizoa, remember? Conjunctivitis, pink eye. And then we get the cough flick spot. Those wider, those wider bluish spots with the erythematous base we find in the buccal mucosa in the mouth. Uh, from there, we move into that rash, right? We, and that's a four to seven day phase. And that's where you get that red blotchy rash that starts at the face, moves its way down into the thorax and then to the extremities. So these are the phases that we need to know about. You know, a 10 day incubation period, a prodromal phase of four days where we see these symptoms right here. And then the rash phase where we get that characteristic rash we associate with measles. But we also want to talk about the period of communicability, meaning the period that you are contagious. So somebody is more prone to spreading measles. Somebody is communicable or contagious about one day before the prodromal symptoms start up to four days after the rash starts, okay? So you start spreading the disease one day before you enter the prodromal phase and then four days after the onset of your rash. And that is your period of communicability for the measles virus. 
So we're going to talk about susceptibility and resistance. So you're going to be a heck of a lot less susceptible to this if you get your MMR vaccination. It's a very, very successful immunization. And then our infants are at risk for this because we do not give the immunization until 12 to 15 months of life. Not only that, infants are the population we usually see some of the severe complications with the measles virus. So just one dose of the MMR vaccine usually induces immunity to 94 to 98% of its recipients. It's a very, very successful vaccine. After the second dose, well, about 99% of recipients will be immune to uh, measles after that second dose. Our infants, they will get some residual maternal, maternal antibodies. They'll get some antibodies from the mother, uh, especially if the mother had measles. And that lasts about six to nine months but it's not as strong for mothers who just received immunization. But still, they do get some of that maternal antibodies from them to help give them some protection until they become, you know, they meet that age range. And we usually give the first dose 12 to 15 months of life. So preventative measures, public education, right? We've got to encourage immunizations, right? Make sure the public knows that immunizations are safe, that immunizations are the reason that our lifespan has grown so much in the modern society. Um, for people who have come in contact with somebody ex with the measles uh, virus, somebody who's exposed to the measles virus, we can give them what's called the immunoglobin uh, injections, okay? Immunoglobin injections, what that is, is they take the plasma of several people who have antibodies to diseases like measles. So immunoglobin has a lot of antibodies. It's got hepatitis antibodies in it. It's got mumps antibodies in it. It's got rubella antibodies in it. So uh, immunoglobin, what they do is they take the plasma and they concentrate it down and they try to take those antibodies and they inject them into people to, to give them those antibodies to help fight this if they're exposed to it. And a lot of times immunoglobin, the Ig is given about 72 hours after the exposure and we can do it within that 72 hours to six hour window. If it's under 72 hours, they'll just give you the vaccine, the normal MMR vaccine. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit here, okay? So public education, encourage immunization. If you find out there was a risk for exposure, you gotta find the timeline within 72 hours, we just give them the MMR vaccine. If it's 72 hours to six days, we can give them that immunoglobin injection, that IG. Immunization, immunization. Don't listen to celebrities, all right? Don't take your, your medical advice from Jenny McCarthy. All right, these immunizations are safe and they save lives. Measles used to be a severe disease. It used to kill a significant amount of people. It still kills a significant amount of people in the undeveloped world. All right, immunizations. Don't listen to Jenny McCarthy. And then requiring immunizations for public schools, usually you have to get that second dose, right? Because that first dose you get around... Uh, uh, 12 to 15 months, and that second dose anywhere from four to six years, right as a kid gets ready to go into public school, that's going to help prevent this from happening. All right, so uh, controlling patients and contacts. Well, this is something that is mandatory, has mandatory reporting in the United States and many countries. And a lot of times that reporting needs to be done within 24 hours to your local public health, to the CDC and the Navy and the Marine Corps. We've got to report this to the Navy Marine Corps Public Health Center. And this is in accordance with our medical surveillance and reporting. And you can find further guidance on that in our technical manual, 6220.112, our, our manual on what we need to report, what medical uh, events we are obligated to report. Isolation, well, um, anybody who's hospitalized with measles, we need to make sure we put them in respiratory isolation. And then uh, children, they should be kept out of school if they have measles, obviously, until that fourth day after the rash. Because as we learned about the period of communicability, after the fourth day of the rash, you, you're no longer really spreading the disease anymore. You're no longer contagious. And then immunizations, okay? Um, we give uh, live attenuated immunizations if, within 72 hours of exposure. Usually that's early enough to just give you the immunization. Your body will recognize it and it'll develop those antibodies. And it's, it's a live vaccination, but when we say attenuated, attenuated, it means we've weakened it. We've weakened it so your immune system will win, your immune system will make antibodies. So hopefully 
if we give it within 72 hours, we're within that time frame. We're within that time frame that our immune system will attack this attenuated, make the antibodies, and those antibodies will get developed in enough time to fight that exposure, to fight that actual live virus you may have been exposed to. And then we talked about immunoglobin already. Immunoglobin, we can give that uh, within six days. So after that 72 hours within, and then within six days, that can help. And again, what immunoglobin is, is we take the plasma from people who have the antibodies for this already, we concentrate it down, and we inject those antibodies into somebody. So let's review what we've gone over. What were some other names for measles? Well, we have rubella, not rubella, rubella, hard measles, red measles, and more bili. What are the white to bluish spots with erythematous bases that appear on the buccal mucosa of a person infected with measles? Those white to bluish spots with erythematous bases that we see in the inside of the cheeks, that are, those are our coplic spots, coplic spots. What are some other symptoms of measles? Well, we get a cough, we get coryzoa, we get conjunctivitis, we get a fever, right? And these are all our prodromal, right? We get our, these are our prodromal plus our coplic spots, and then we get that rash. What is a rare complication of measles that can manifest itself several years after the primary infection? All right, the one that we think it, we think the kid's okay, but then they get this several years later or a couple years later. That would be subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, SSPE, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. What is the normal incubation period of measles? The normal incubation period. So you're exposed to it, you've got the virus, how long until your symptoms start? About 10 days, 10 days and your symptoms are gonna start. What is a typical period of communicability with measles? Meaning, when are you usually contagious, right, throughout the phase of this disease? What, what is a typical period of communicability with measles? One day before the prodromal period, so one day between before that fever and our three C's, cough, conjunctivitis, coryzoa, and coplic spots, till four days after the onset of rash, okay? One day before prodromal period to four days after the onset of rash, that is when we are contagious. So that wraps up this presentation on measles. My resources for this were, of course, the Control for Communicable Disease Manual and, of course, the Center for Disease Control. I also looked at the World Health Organization for some uh, statistics and whatnot. I hope this helped out. Good luck to you on your advancement exams.